Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. Error monitoring is provided by Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. I'm Brian Scott, and it's go time. It's Go Time, a weekly podcast where we discuss interesting topics around the Go programming language, the community, and everything in between. If you currently write Go or aspire to, this is the show for you. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Go Time. Uh, today's episode is number 69. And today on the show, we have myself, Eric St. Martin. Uh, Brian Kettleson is also here. Hello. And Carlicia Pinto. Hi, everybody. And we're peak Brian today because our guest today <laughs> is Brian Scott, who happens to work for a mouse. So, Brian, uh, you actually work on and kind of contribute to a number of open source projects. Um, do you want to give maybe our guests who aren't familiar with you um, kind of a rundown of kind of your history and some of the things you work on? Uh, sure. Um, so on my professional time, you know, obviously uh, I work on a lot of like web operations, uh, guest facing applications, web technologies, cloud automation. Uh, but for my open source side of my life, um, I do maintain a project called golangflow.io, which was heavily inspired by like RubyFlow. Uh, by uh, Peter Cooper, right, uh, out of London, I believe. And it's it's essentially just that. It's literally a replica of RubyFlow, but written in Buffalo um, and obviously powered by Go. Um, and it's, you know, uh, it gives uh, the community a chance to kind of post their favorite news articles and whatnot, which automatically get posted to Twitter. And then uh, along with all the other like Twitter bots that are that are scattered all across the like, Twitterverse. That's from me. Uh, I also contribute to a bunch of open source libraries. I do have a a, have a couple of favorites, uh, for instance, like Kali uh, is my favorite library uh, for scraping content off the web. Um, I do. I am also starting to kind of get into the whole like blockchain uh, era, so uh, I've been you know reading up a lot of of uh, Go packages that kind of integrate with like with the blockchain. And if I'm not mistaken, too, you're also um, kind of jumping into the serverless world as well, right? Yes, yes. Um, I have been waiting a long time for Go support. Uh, on the Amazon Lambda front, um, that just got released recently. So I've been heavily, uh, you know, even before that, uh, I used a lot of other tools to kind of push, you know, functions either into the Google platform. Uh, I believe Azure has like their own platform for actual functions, right? And also been playing around with uh, OpenFast as well. So I've been doing like serverless for quite a while, but uh, definitely love the actual like, native support. So um, OpenFast, uh, what's your kind of experience with that? That's one that um, I've been keeping my eye on, but haven't had time to actually uh, invest in it. Um, I think it's great. Um, uh, I mean, especially for like, you know, those teams or folks who necessarily don't have access to, you know, functions as a service uh, within their like current like cloud providers, you know, n not all cloud providers like support that. Uh, great for especially for environments that are like on premise, right? Like within like your local environment that you want to do some, you know, provide that same type of service to like your uh, dev teams that you may support. Um, I think it's great. I think there's going to be a lot coming out of it. Um, I've been kind of playing with it a little bit today uh, over the past couple of weeks. Um, I think now there's been some, there's, there's even some like full-time support that's been added on to uh, OpenFast. Um, and I think Go, honestly, is just a great like, contribution to that because, you know, obviously within functions, you want to kind of keep like your memory footprint very low as well as your execution time, right? And with the concurrency like primitives that Go offers, I think that goes very well hand in hand. So how do you see functions uh, sitting in the overall landscape of architecture? I, I struggle to, to understand where a good place to, put functions and serverless is? Where where do you see that fitting in architectures that you make? I think right now, you know, I think like the landscape is still very open. I think folks are still trying to grasp like the best approach when to use functions. Uh, right now, like I tend to use functions for quick, uh, like one-offs for instance, for like ETL jobs, you know, or even like transcoding jobs. They need to like quickly transcode uh, a video file or maybe 
run some operation against like an image file. Um, but even though, you know, even among the API web landscape, right, it's becoming a, a thing where you break your application more and more into these like, microservices instead of, you know, having like a whole like, dedicated service to a, a particular role in your application is now, you know, just like split out as a function. And, it's, you know, since functions are also so cheap to actually run, you can now build these massive applications, you know, broken up into many different functions. And if you kind of look on how, where we came from, right? Like we came from like physical hardware to running now these like virtual machines, you know, within the cloud to now running processes within like containers. And now we're even going down even smaller to where we're now just running functions. And if you think about it, you know, like now that there's this movement of, hey, pushing out functions out to the edge, right? Like you see like Cloudflare, and like Amazon and like even others pushing functions as a primitive out to the edge. You can even maybe even see like, hey, you know, soon maybe like my rooftop might might become like a a compute layer to where I can run functions, right? And now you can start like leasing out that compute in that space, right? So I think we're going to see functions become more of like a mainstream into uh, into actually running uh, code. So I I definitely think that's going to be a big boost over like the next few years uh, towards like functions as a service. So, and even with like OpenFAS, I think that's going to even allow even uh, more groups to have to kind of gain that experience and learn more about how they should design their applications um, and think more of, hey, uh, let me make this endpoint an actual function instead of actually designing like a, a entire service. So you mentioned the pushing uh, functions out to the edge. Um, for anybody listening who wants to do that, I have a beefy computer with some idle, uh, a lot of idle CPU and a pretty good internet connection. I will happily rent it for, <laughs> for functions at the edge in Tampa. <laughs> well, I think about it, right? Like soon, like everything can be like compute, right? And you can start like leasing, literally leasing out your own like compute out to anyone who needs, who needs that time or that, you know, or that power to actually run like their functions. I mean, now with the whole like cryptocurrency coming out, it just becomes more of a of a thing, right? Like, hey, you know, let me go ahead and lease this out for some type of uh, like actual currency. And I think that's even going to drive the cost down uh, of compute um, very much. Yeah, I think serverless is really interesting. It's something that like I've had my eye on for, like you said, kind of ETL and batch jobs and and things like that. But I haven't connected yet with kind of like this all serverless vision that some people have, you know, where the web request comes in to a serverless function, which calls other functions. And there's, there's no real full fledged service that things have hit. Um, and that might just be because of the use cases of stuff that I've worked on, but I haven't bought fully into that yet. And maybe I just don't have the vision yet. <laughs> yeah. It takes time. Right. I mean, like back when I was doing serverless, like, like a year ago, like, Go wasn't fully supported within like within like Lambda yet. Uh, it was supported within other like serverless like frameworks, but I used Apex right to quickly like be able to like tar up my full web app. And I remember writing a web app uh, in in Buffalo and actually running a full app within serverless and it's just attaching to that backend database right that's running within like a managed service. But um, I think over time there's going to be a lot of lessons learned and there's going to be a lot of breakthroughs in how we can use serverless and actually like push forward. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, it is still early, right? I think that there'll be better abstractions and things that kind of uh, make it more approachable, right? It's not that I don't yeah. see the value in paying for compute by the second only as a request comes in. It really, um, my not sharing the vision yet is really in lots of unanswered questions about the maintainability um, and debugability of an application that behaves that way. Yeah, you're right. And I think like the way of the way that we debug applications and the way that we design for like clean code and good architecture and best practice is going to change as we move more and more into serverless because it does require a different level of thinking. Um, and again, like, you know, people call it serverless, but just remember, you know, there's still there's still servers running behind those functions. There's still, you know, power and cables running into those servers. And then there's still a foundation and, and people, actual human beings still you know, managing um, all that equipment. So it, it's still good to know that, you know, okay, there's still some type of operations behind it. There's still a foundation. There's still servers running this function somewhere. But I think, you know, as infrastructure kind of climbs up the stack higher and higher, 
you know, that line's going to blur. And soon again, again, you know, as we do move into serverless at the edge, compute is just going to be a thing, right? It's just going to be anywhere that you, like, that you actually, like, need it. Yeah, and I think you start thinking about that really versus like short-lived versus long-lived processes. Because mm-hmm. even as we adopt the cloud more and, you know, Kubernetes as a service offerings and stuff like that, managed Kubernetes, you know, essentially that could be looked at as serverless too, right? Because your managed Kubernetes cluster could be set up to auto-scale the compute behind the scenes for you and and all of these things. And you never, you know, say the even the worker nodes end up managed at some point, right? Like we could end up in a world like that where, you know, it's just even, um, you know, some of these container-based services, ACI, you know, we have and some others, like you just throw the container at it. All of those things, you don't really have to think about the provisioning of um, the hardware and all these things that happen. So serverless really is an interesting buzzword because it's, you know, it could be applied right. to a lot more as kind of managed cloud infrastructure evolves. Yeah, you're right. Totally right. And I think, you know, the more and more that the developers interact with serverless, we're going to see a lot of new creative things like come out of it. Um, you know, like just being able to run like your own little hobby project or be able to quickly, you know, uh, test and uh, outline something to see if this is actually, if this idea is actually going to work. You can quickly just throw that up into it as a, as a function and really only pay for, you know, what gets used, especially if you're only doing like a, like a, let's say like a hobby site or some actual like quick test that literally costs you nothing. Oh, that's true too. You're not paying for all the idle time of exactly your website yeah. running and you get, you know, three hits a month or whatever. You know? Yeah, exactly. You only pay, you know, for, for like what you need. And you no, know, I mean, there's a lot of best practice to kind of go with that serverless, right? Like make sure that your execution time is small, making sure that your memory footprint stays within, within like a certain limit. I think, you know, we now need to start thinking more of that. It's before it's like, hey, you know, I have a, I have a box with, you know, eight cores and 32 gigs of RAM. I don't really need to care about how much resources I'm actually like using, but I think in the world of less serverless, you don't have to pay more attention to that. I just really want um, Kelsey Hightower's no code to catch on so that I can retire. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. That project has blown up quite a bit, quite a bit. My question around serverless is, is kind of how do you, uh, how do you map your orchestration? How do you see what your endpoints and how they, they map to URLs and which is calling which? You know, it, it kind of feels like serverless has the potential to be a, a big pile of spaghetti that you can't understand? Mm-hmm. I think, you know, like as cloud providers support more and more of like the serverless era of things, right? I think like even now you're seeing like such things like API gateways that are being layered on top of uh, serverless technology, such as like Lambda, right? And, and functions as a service. You're going to see these technologies start to bubble up that allow you to map your actual, you know, endpoints that are exposed out to the public to your backend functions. And I think with that, you'll start seeing um, new idioms of software come out to where, hey, we can go ahead and map that out for you and create things, you know, know, like right now with like Kubernetes, if you go to like Weave Networks, right, you can just point Weave at your, you know, at, you know, go ahead and deploy that into your like Kubernetes like cluster. You can kind of get this visual map of how all the interactions between all your pods are actually talking to each other. And I think that same type of concept will soon be uh, available for even serverless technology where you can see all your functions and see which API mappings are actually mapped back to those functions and how they all in, um, interact together. You can start seeing maybe some, you know, hey, how long did this function take to actually execute? And what is the latency between function A and function B and how that relates to actual function C, right? So I think, I don't think, uh, we're actually there yet. I think maybe like some of those concepts are still starting to be uh, thought about. But I mean, uh, hopefully, at least for me, but personally, I hope that we start seeing those types of tools being created. But yeah, that's still a problem. Like, right now, it is a spaghetti, you know, pool of functions, and it, it unless you have that visual map, uh, or, or it's still hard to kind of see. Okay, like again, where what do all these functions do, and um, how do they interact with each other that makes sense it seems like you know we're, we're at the beginning of this process and some some nice patterns and configurations will evolve over time 
Yes. Yeah, I believe so. I think with, with any technology, right, it, it just takes time uh, for us to kind of flesh out all the all the problems and actually create like, solutions to those problems. Fair enough. Let's um, let's move to another topic that I know you're deeply into. You mentioned a little bit earlier, Buffalo. Can you tell me about um, building Golang Flow with Buffalo and, and how that's working out for you? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I first met Mark Bates, the creator of Buffalo at GopherCon last year in 2017. But prior to that, we we're actually talking quite a bit um, for, you know, for years, I got started with Go many years ago. Um, and, you know, at the time I had a mentor who was kind of teaching me the fundamentals of, of like, you know, of like AI and like machine learning. And he really wanted to get me into like Erlang. Now, at the time, I was a big Rails guy. I was all about Rails. Um, I was, I just loved the ease of the tooling. I loved the ease of being able to have access to packages and libraries that were able to like solve things for me. Like for example, if I needed to actually send email, I can use like the mailer action or the mailer like controller to actually uh, be able to add the mail functionality into my application. So when Buffalo came out, um, it, it was just like a revelation for me. It was it was it was something that I wanted to, to like jump into right away, and I saw the promise that Buffalo provided to the developers to be able to easily extend and kind of create that same ecosystem that like Rails did, like for Ruby. Um, so when during my Rails days, I was deep into things like Railscast, and uh, I followed like you know like Peter Cooper, and saw all the all the cool things that he built. And I feel like, you know what, for me to quickly learn Buffalo would be awesome if I can just go ahead and create some type of application that allowed me to kind of like utilize all the functionality of Buffalo. So right before, actually during GopherCon last year, uh, I sat with, with like Mark Bates and I had this idea to create something like RubyFlow, but that would allow me to learn all the ins and outs of Buffalo. So literally within just a couple of days, I was able to scaffold and get the majority of the uh, golangflow.io site fully operational. And, you know, it actually took off uh, pretty quickly. I was able to see that there was a number of users that were creating accounts that were, you know, posting their own like, news articles and or updates on technology that they were like, passionate about. Um, and then I quickly thought, you know, it'll be cool if I can go ahead and tie this into Twitter. So I went ahead and easily extended Buffalo to actually do some pattern matching and actually pick out which articles it thought would be popular to push out onto Twitter and use the Golang the hashtag. So it's been an amazing experience. Um, it, I'm able to prototype and to literally test out new features pretty quickly. And the roadmap, at least from what I've seen, you know, as far as like pull requests and, and issues, there's just, there's just a lot more coming. And I think recently now, I think associations just got added to the pop package which will allow you to do different like, database actions with associations, which you had when, you know, when you're developing in like the real space. Yeah. That just landed uh, last week in pop and it's, it's very exciting. Changed. Yeah. Changed a lot of the code that I have from many lines down to just one or two. I think you said it really well about the idea that rails uh, heavily inspired the, the workflow of Buffalo. But I think my favorite part is the fact that, it still feels like I'm doing a Go website. You know, I don't, yes, it does. I it don't does. feel the magic. I don't feel. I don't feel like I'm. I'm trapped in some crazy paradigm. It's just Go web development and really sane defaults. And I, I think it's great on how open it is. Is that you know if if you're a developer and you do want to change something, you do want to swap out something, you can't. There's like nothing stopping you from actually doing that, right? Um, and again, it's it allows you to use Buffalo the best way that you want to use it. And again, you're still developing in Go. You're still following all those best practices, and you still have access to all that best tooling, right? You can still follow whatever workflow you're normally like used to using. But I think Buffalo does make it easier for you. What kind of um, traffic spikes have you seen with Golang Flow? Do you have metrics on on your requests? Yeah. Um, yeah. So far, uh, as far as RSS feeds, so there is a RSS feed uh, that another like contributor to Golang Flow actually added, um, and we so far have about I think I would I want to say just under two thousand subscribers on the RSS feed, uh, mainly from outside the like, US, 
Um, and then as far as users, we have about, I would say about 120 uh, logged in users into, into the GoLink flow right now. Um, and that was just in the past like month and a half. And, and ideally, I mean, I get roughly, I would say about 200 page views a day. So it's, it's pretty good. The average user spends about five, 10 minutes just browsing through all the pages or at least all the posts that are currently on online GoLink flow. So it's only gaining traction. Um, I think, you know, it, it's still fairly new. Um, but again, it's really for more of like a learning exercise. And what I do like is that I'm already getting issues where there's, you know, other uh, developers out there that are using it to actually learn Buffalo. They're actually going in and see how the application uses different features of Buffalo. So whenever a new feature or or uh, a new like generator gets added into Buffalo, I do try and think of some way to integrate that into Golang Flow just for others to actually learn um, how that's you know how to use that properly. So when, for instance, when like Mark added the whole background workers into Buffalo, I quickly thought of, hey, I can use this to actually automate the tweeting out or posts out to Twitter. Um, and same thing for the actual mailer. I do plan on adding some type of like newsletter type of a deal into Golink Flow to where, hey, if you don't want to go to the site every day or if you don't want to be um, subscribed to the RSS feed, then you can go ahead and just quickly you know, sign up to the, to the newsletter and just get like a weekly email of like all the recent posts. That would use like the actual mailer, um, like generator, like within Buffalo. That's nice. So, is there any real social component to this? Is there upvoting or downvoting? Are there comments? So, I do have plans to add uh, things like, yeah, things like upvoting and downvoting. Um, I just don't want to give the sense that, hey, because this was like, if you know, if you're a developer and you're really passionate about something that that you just built and you post it there. I don't want to give like a negative feeling that, hey, it got downvoted, right? So it's been something that I've been thinking about. Instead of like downvoting, or like like upvoting, I've been thinking about maybe adding likes and, and like comments. So a post can get X number of, of like likes, and then it can you can also add, add comments if you want. Uh, but there's a sharing functionality. So if you do see a post that you like, there is like, you know, a little toolbar that, you know, has like Twitter, Facebook, and, and such to where you can easily like share those posts out. See, that was one of the things that I kind of like most about Golang Flow is that there is no comment section. So it never turns into Reddit or Hacker News. And there are no upvotes or downvotes. So it's just a steady stream of good posts. I can look at the ones that are titled well to get my attention, but I just I like not having all of that socially votey stuff. Yeah, I wanted to keep it very like, neutral. You know, um the good thing is that like like right now. When you create a post in, in like GoLangFlow.io and you actually add your title, it's not very apparent. I need to make this actually like stand out more, but you can actually add your own hashtags. So if you want your post to stand out in certain hashtags on Twitter, you can actually add hashtags into the title. And those same hashtags would be used when the background worker actually runs to post your post onto Twitter or tweet your post. Up. That's really cool. Yeah. So, yeah, it's been growing. You know, it's a. Uh, a growing, a growing project. Um, luckily, it doesn't take too much of my time. And even when I do spend some time on it, those features I can usually code out pretty quickly. You know, and I actually feel really guilty about this and nobody tell Mark Bates, but I still have <laughs> not written anything in Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, I think you really have to like find like, you know, like what you, I mean, for me, Buffalo was, hey, I wanted to build something in it to actually learn it. Um, you know, I don't consider myself a Go expert at all. I'm still learning just like everyone else. Uh, you know, I mean, there's folks, there's going to be people out there who want to use frameworks. There's going to be people out there who want to just use the center library. Uh, and that's, you know, and that's what they're most like, comfortable with, right? All right. So I think we need to talk about the topic of the week because there is one thing that's happened this week. In Go, and I, I'm, I'm not moving directly onto news yet, but there is a thing that happened and that's the big drop of the Vigo Go 110? Uh, no. App. Yeah, <laughs> Go 110, yeah, that was it, yeah. Of, of versioned Go. So if you haven't heard, because you aren't tied into the news like I am with a drip feed every morning, uh, versioned Go is a fork of the Go tool that supports um, versioning capabilities. It, it replaces Go Get. It replaces DEP. And it allows you to create reproducible builds. And it does that by creating a, a module file, go.mod, 
that describes your module and its dependencies. And it's a big deal because it's it's learning from DEP, but it's it's mostly not DEP. So it's completely new. If you haven't been reading these, um, at the point of this um, recording, uh, there's been five posts on Russ Cox's blog kind of describing the problem and how Vigo works and um, kind of like how, how that mod file works, how imports work, uh, a new algorithm he's designed called Minimal, minimal Version Selection. Um, and rumor has it there's two more to come, uh, possibly one more of those today. So this has been a big discussion, especially with everybody kind of recently uh, jumping on DEP. Yeah, didn't um, didn't Sam uh, just post a blog post about DEP and Vigo not too long ago as well? He did yeah, just just a day or two ago. He he made a a response to the Vigo post talking about the technical merits of the Vigo ideas and his concerns about. The implementation, um, it wasn't it wasn't really deep in terms of technical problems. It was more of a introductory post that said he was going to be posting more. Got it. Got it. He also mentioned he is going to be working on Vigo. Yeah, I think um, he has been kind of set as a resource to work on some components of Vigo. I forget which ones those are now, <laughs> but. Uh, development of DEP will still continue. And I believe he said that he's got, he's going to have some more posts coming out. Um, and I know that him and Russ have had lots of discussions as well. That's good. Um, about some of his concerns. Um, it, it's interesting, right? Um, I accept that Russ and Sam probably know much more about uh, dependency management and uh, kind of building that graph of dependencies and things like that than I do. Um, but I, I actually really like the Vigo approach, even the minimal version selection. I think that there's some confusion around it, but I actually really like how simple that is um, because I've, I've bitten, been bitten more than once by the unintentional updates of transitive dependencies breaking crap. And that's just, it's a pain to solve. It's it's a pain to get back the old version. I agree with you. And I think this definitely, I think there has to be some level of deep effort to solve the problem. Right? I mean, DEP definitely solved a lot of problems. You know, I love DEP. Uh, I, it, it solved all my use cases, right? Yeah, I've totally been bitten by, by that too, where something changes, you know, uh, down the stream. It just really affects you and you really can't find like the, like the previous version of it. Um, I don't have that problem too many times, but I, I definitely know that, you know, and I'm glad that, you know, Sam and, uh, and, and team are definitely, you know, working and hopefully, you know, maybe they just take the best things out of both, you know, Vigo and Dep and create something even better. I was hoping to see Dep, you know, actually brought into the Go tool chain and actually have that like a native command. Um, I was actually waiting for that. Um, but, you know, if there's more time that's needed to actually flesh out a fuller solution for not only for versioning, but as well as for like debt management, I think they should definitely like go ahead and then like do that. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple points with it, right? Like, um, I think it's the minimal version selection that is um, where Sam is kind of debating that that may be too simplistic, and I and I think that's okay too, right? Is um, I, I know Russ and team and all those, you know, they. And they want to move quick, and I think they're anticipating trying to get this into 1.11 um, and maybe solidified by 1.12. But I know that they will um, kind of hold back if there seems to be issues, and maybe there's somewhere in between. But like this whole mod file approach, I think is really interesting because tools like DEP don't really leverage the um, dependencies of dependencies right like transitive dependencies yes. there's yes you know it, the depth file is great for that top level but you know it's not doing anything for the dependencies of dependencies and i really like that about the mod file is trying to make sense of you know your transitive dependencies and what's the best thing to select you're right you're right absolutely right and um i, I definitely you know when you're designing 
reliable software, you, you definitely need to make sure that you have those dependencies that lock down, you know, and some languages do it better than others. Um, but I, you know, I think that definitely needs to be solved. And I would love to see some type of a early version of that, you know, definitely um, put out there sooner than, than later. Yeah. And I mean, I, I also really like that it's very much in line with the ease of use of, um, you know, go get that we're used to. And um, I think on the round table, Russ had mentioned that there's going to be a post, the post coming out today, I think is the one is going to talk a little bit about um, proxies, but like you can look inside the code itself and everything. There's going to be a notion of proxy servers so that you don't necessarily have to go directly to GitHub or wherever and have the tools, the version control tools locally to fetch that. And I think that's a super, super powerful concept as well, especially when we start talking about, um, you know, people, you know, the, the whole left pad type issues and people just kind of, you know, taking their toys and going home and, you know, being able to have, you know, uh, kind of like a canonical place, maybe even internally that your company has vetted these particular packages and you can fetch them from there. I would tell you that that will go very, very far with the enterprise, um, you know, working for the enterprise. Again, this is my own opinions and, and views, but that will go very far in the enterprise, uh, especially for when, when like security teams need to vet packages that, that you're fetching out, out to the world. Like, you know, if you look at, if you look at how we write Java now, like there's these tools like Nexus from like some type that will allow you to, you know, again, to have those proxies where you can pre-cache those those dependencies internally and then be able to actually vet them before you actually include them in production software. And I think that will go a very long way into furthering the use of, of Go uh, as an enterprise development language. Yeah, I think it's going to be super, super powerful um, to do that and for reprodu reproducibility and being able to have central caches and things like that. And yeah, yeah I mean, in the enterprise world, without a doubt, having um, projects vetted um, is, is going to be huge and just yeah. kind of having your own central repo that gets updated. Yeah, you know, I've been shouting that from the mountaintop, you know, two conference talks that I've given in the last year have been about how much the enterprise needs more control over that and more reproducibility. I think the the proxy idea in Vigo will get us much closer to what we're looking for. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, and even now, even just talking about it now, I really wish that, that like that was like into like full tuition right now, right? Like I can totally like, use that like right now. And uh, yeah, you know, can't wait until that hopefully, you know, becomes like a thing um, because that's really like the type of solution that we need right now. Well, it, it's funny because uh, we were keeping this relatively secret, but I'm reading the last blog post from Russ. Uh, I don't think it's today's post. It's yesterday's post. And somebody said something about uh, we really need a, a centralized repository for Go modules and yada, yada, yada. And Russ replies, it's very important to me that there be mirrors that are easy to run. For example, Brian Kettleson, Eric St. Martin, Jess Frizzell, and others on their team are starting to work on a plan that about what this might look like. <laughs> so the cat's great. out of the bag. Yeah, Russ, Russ dropped the, the news for us. Uh, we are working on a centralized repository for Go modules with Vigo support. And that's very important to us. Yeah, with some of the, with the proxy ability. So it'd be compatible with the, the proxying. And also um, another concern too is um, the most recent, recent post of his um, talks about um, kind of verifiable builds where looking at the SHA and things like that to make sure that things haven't been tampered with. But there's also kind of um, this whole provenance issue too, that when we start thinking about that, you know, that uh, when we start talking about proxy servers, have I been served um, the, the actual copy of it or has it been tampered with, right? Even the sense of somebody taking ownership of a repository um, you know, it got deleted and somebody creates it and then, you know, creates a new version there so that you upgrade to it. Um, there's a lot of these types of issues and we're starting to kind of sketch out some ideas of what 
um, we might be able to do to kind of solve provenance and integrity issues there, you know, using cryptographic signatures or things of that nature. I was just about to say that you took the words right out of my mouth. Like the blockchain has so many different applications. If you look at tools like, like for instance, like Keybase, right, that actually publicizes your keys onto the blockchain, right, to actually maintain that that integrity, that those same principles can be applied like to these proxies. So, yeah, and it, it'll be interesting to be able to do stuff like that and to have, you know, mirrors of these things and think about sharing and everything. Um, I, I can't say that we're, we have a finalized idea, but, you know, we're definitely having discussions. We are diagramming some stuff out and bouncing it off people. And uh, when we get more details on what these things will look like and have some working examples, you know, uh, we'll definitely let the world see them. But it's, it is interesting to think about, you know, like it's a scary thought, like, you know, if somebody takes control of a proxy or, or whatever, you know, how do I guarantee that, you know, I'm getting the code that I think I'm getting. And especially because we all have like this inherent nature of just you know go install and run it right like and, <laughs> yeah and this isn't unique to go right like people have been gem installing stuff and everything for oh, ages carla bash you know <laughs> yeah. <the> same thing <laughs> so yes yes the, you're absolutely right i mean even even with like docker pool right like you're docker pulling like some image you know down from like the hub you don't, you don't know if it was like tampered with right so yeah definitely need to create solutions to these problems so, Carlicia, have you yeah. have you had a chance to to look at any of this stuff? No, I did not. I looked at the, I started looking at the post and I saw how tiny the fonts were and I said, uh, "Nope." <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I mean, I, I can make the fonts larger, but seriously, <laughs> does it have to be that tiny? Um, no, it's a lot of stuff there. I haven't had time this week. Was super super busy for me. And I'm actually very tired today. I'm sorry I'm not uh, participating as much. The the one thing that my biggest question is about having the central repository for packages, which you guys were just talking about. I think this is a necessary step to have. Yeah, and I think one of the important things is that it not be um, a forced central repository either that it can be kind of opt in right mm -hmm. so if you want to just go get stuff straight from github like hey by, by all means you do that um yeah. but if you want something that is maybe more trusted um for verification of signatures and, and things like this then you know maybe maybe you leverage the central repository yep totally agree with that yeah that's true yeah and, and also having the ability of having your own central repository like uh, Brian was talking about. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, people need to to be able to run their own mirrors or proxies or or whatever, whatever we decide the nomenclature for this is. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that will be that's going to be big. You know, uh, being able to actually do that, especially have it be behind your firewall and, and mirror from actual trusted proxies. All right. So, what else do we have for news this week? Um, 110 came out, um, which uh, introduces all the built-in test caching, which should make things uh, run much faster. I'm trying to think of new features that came in Go 1.10. I don't remember there being a ton. Yeah, there wasn't a bunch. Uh, I I skimmed through the change log, but I wasn't able to actually really remember any anything that was major. Uh, besides the caching piece, there was a caching piece, I believe, for tests. I believe there was a caching added to how tests are ran. Right. If the, one... if the code doesn't change, then the test results are cached. So yes. you don't actually rerun the code or rerun the tests for packages that haven't changed code. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That was the thing that stood out to me the most. Um, but again, I didn't finish reading the uh, all the changes. Even so, I have 110 installed on my laptop right now. <laughs> yeah, I I have 110 installed, but I can't say that I've written a line of code. Well, I guess I did. Yes, I did. Uh, but I haven't written much code against it. I've written, uh, I would say, quite a bit in the past couple of hours on 1.10. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's awesome. All right. So we talked about all the Vigo stuff. Um, in the show notes, we'll drop links to all of the posts um, that exist. Um, I don't know whether it's recorded, but there was actually a roundtable just before the recording of this show where Jess Frizzell, Sam Boyer, and Russ were all on talking about dependency management. Um, if that's recorded, I will link to that. Um, what else we got? Um, so I came across a really cool project called Git Leaks um, as well. That's super cool for um, kind of scanning your Git repos to, to look for leak credentials for services. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool, especially when a lot of folks, you know, it just you don't really think about it, but I'm sure everyone's guilty of putting some type of secret into their, you know, into Git. Yeah, it happens all the time by accident all the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> at least now there's something that can help you uh you know, locate those secrets and remove them i remember uh you know when we found you know remember when like i used to find secrets and like in like my repos i would have to use that tool uh bfg that would literally blast away all the git history for that oh yeah like commit <laughs> yeah <laughs> i remember so, that that was yeah wow there's another one too for doing for doing stuff like that and i can't remember the name of it i pulled it up for somebody uh probably like a year ago so here's a another interesting one who wrote who read the uh cloudflare post about using go as a scripting language uh i, I did. read that i did I, I ran i read that that entire post and i even gave it a try i even actually followed it and actually tried it out yeah i thought that that was really really interesting and it it, it would be um a fun experiment to see, you know, how many people start using Go for things like that instead of Perl or Bash or PHP or I think it'd be great. You know, just that you just have to think about like, okay, you have to push this minor change to all your boxes, right? Like you have to push that that you have to, you know, uh I believe you have to go ahead and then uh you know extend uh the exec uh within the kernel to actually support like the like dot go files. And I, I think that's just something that you have to like think about when you we, we do want to begin scripting with Go, but I think it's great. I think it's a great post. And I actually posted that on Golang Flow, actually. The interesting thing, though, would be that, you know, it's and not a lot of people want to do that work, um, you know, but if it could get baked in in the distro to begin with, that would that would, I think, make it a lot easier to to just use it as a scripting language. Yeah, it'd be great. It'd be awesome, actually. <laughs> So um, another cool project um, I've mentioned before is Pixel, which is like a 2D game library um, written in Go. Um, they released version 0 0.7, and I'm trying to remember the stuff that changed with it, um, but I think it's been like a year or more since the last version. All this stuff with Vigo has my mind crowded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely tends to read. So is, that, is Pixel new? I mean, I've, I've been, I was actually searching for a game library just just the other week, the past week, uh, because you know I was I've been reading this book, uh, Ready Player One, and it got me thinking about all the '80s games, and I wanted to to develop a game and go. And I was actually looking at, at game libraries, and actually I did come across that one. Um, I, I just wasn't sure how maintained it was. Uh, it's been around for a while. I think it has been like a year or so since it has had an update. Um, there's a couple of others I'll, I'll think of and I'll send them to you. Um, but great, great. there's been a few, there's been a few game libraries and 3d things that, um, we've brought up on the show before. Yeah. I believe, uh, Francis Campoy wrote that whole life, uh, with it flappy bird or floppy bird, uh, on the just for funk. Yeah. He actually literally codes a entire game, like in two episodes. I need to watch those again. Yeah. They're really good. He just came out with one about, uh, the dependency, uh, in injection. Oh yeah, yeah. I I saw that one mentioned. I haven't watched that yep. one yet. Yep, they're good. They're good. All right. So, did anybody have any other um, projects, news, articles? I will take that as a no. That's a no. Uh, did anybody have a project for Free Software Friday? They want to give a shout out to. I want to give a shout out to the one you're going to give a shout out to. So, why don't you go <laughs> first? <laughs> so. Mine for this week, um, I, I want to give a huge shout out to um, Russ Cox and Sam Boyer and everybody else who has been working on dependency management tools, you know, 
the glide maintainers, go vendor, go dep. Um, just because this has been a problem for us. And yeah, we may cycle through some of these while we get to the right approach, but I'm glad that people are investing their time in trying to solve this problem and come up with, you know, the final solution. And I know not everybody can agree sometimes on what that is, but it, it has been nice to see, you know, people who care deeply about the problem that we felt was getting ignored for a long time. Yeah, definitely not a trivial problem to solve. Yeah, I'll jump on that bandwagon too. I think that's a, a wonderful group to shout out. Carolyn Vance, like Matt Farina, Matt Butcher, um, Daniel, whose name I can't pronounce, last name. Um, lots of people working on dependency management and Go. Thank you to all of them for uh, moving us forward to here. Did you have a project you want to give anybody, give a shout out to Brian Scott? Um, I want to say, so recently uh, I've been using a lot of Kali. So again, out to the maintainers of Kali, it's it's a, a great package and library. Um, also, again, like to the whole dependency management space. Uh, I mean, that's a very big problem to actually solve. Really, really grateful for all the time that everyone is giving to actually uh, try and help solve that problem. Uh, despite any, any differences in like opinion, it's still great to see that everyone's getting together to actually try and solve. All right. So with that, um, thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, thanks, a huge thank you to Brian Scott for coming on the show today. Uh, we got to talk about a lot of fun stuff, and I get to get a little more educated in serverless, which is always good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you for, for, for having me. This is a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. We covered all kinds of crazy topics this week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So uh, with that, I definitely encourage sharing the show with uh, fellow Go programmers. Um, you can head over to github.com slash gotimefm slash ping if you have suggestions for guests or topics. Um, and follow us on Twitter at gotimefm. And with that, uh, goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. All right, that's it for this episode of Go Time. Tune in live on Thursdays at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern at changelog.com slash live. Join the community in Slack with us. In real time during the shows, head to changelog.com slash community. Follow us on Twitter. We're at GoTimeFM. Special thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. Also, Linode, we host everything we do on Linode servers. Head to linode.com slash changelog. GoTime is edited by Jonathan Youngblood, and the theme music for GoTime is produced by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. We'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening.